All right, so today we're gonna cover synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, and diarthrosis joints. Now, these are the functional classifications of joints, meaning that these are the words that signify the amount of movement a particular joint has. This is what we will cover today. So let's go ahead and dive into this material. The very first one that we have is synarthrosis. This is also known as synarthrotic joints. These are immovable joints. In other words, these joints have no movement. If you're familiar with the Spanish word sin, this means without. So synarthrotic joints means immovable, without movement, seen. Think of this word right here, seen, without. So if that helps you remember synarthrosis joints, that they are without movement, use it. Now, these types of joints can be of significance because the joints offer the underlying organs protection underneath the articulating bones. For example, we have the sutures of the skull. These immovable sutures help protect the brain. Also, the cartilaginous manubrial sternal joint, where the manubrium, this is the manubrium here, and the sternum, the sternum's right here, articulate. So right here is this joint. And this immovable joint helps to protect the heart. Therefore, it makes sense why these types of joints would need to be immovable. Another example of synarthrotic joints is gomphosis. This is a fibrous immovable joint where the roots of the teeth, known as a peg, articulate with the sockets of the mandible and maxilla. Again, this makes sense. We really don't want our teeth moving around either. These are all known as synarthrotic joints. Now, let's check out the next one. Amphiarthrosis, also known as amphiarthrotic joints. These joints are slightly movable. In other words, these joints have limited mobility or limited movement. Now, a really easy way to remember amphiarthrosis is to remember that it begins with AM. So right here, A M. And often in our older age, in the morning especially, it takes some time for us to get our joints going and warmed up because they're limited in movement in the mornings. Now, if this helps you remember amphiarthrosis joints are limited movement, use it. So just remember A M, amphiarthrosis limited movement. So for example, we have the intervertebral joints. These are these thick flat discs of fibrocartilage that lies between the vertebrae of the spinal column and this allows for limited movement between each disc. Now you may be wondering how it is we can bend over and touch our toes then, if these joints are amphiarthrotic and have only limited mobility. Well, because there are so many of these amphiarthrotic joints with limited mobility in the vertebral column, the sum of them all together allows us to achieve a much greater range of body movement. In other words, all of them are working together, allowing us to achieve a greater range of motion such as bending over and touching our toes. So that's really neat to know about the intervertebral joints along the spine. Next, we have the pubic symphysis. Now, this is another thick, flat disc of fibrocartilage that anchors the left and the right hip bones, more specifically, the left and right pubic bones. Now, I'm not too sure why my picture doesn't have this disc. I licensed this picture with a photograph company. I may have to let them know. But nonetheless, just remember that there is a flat disc here that looks a bit like these discs made of fibrocartilage and it is limited in movement. This joint basically is responsible for anchoring these two bones together. And finally, we have the distal tibiofibular joint, which is a strong, dense, fibrous tissue that functions as an anchor for the distal ends of the tibia and the fibula, only allowing slight movement at this joint. So now let's go ahead and check out diarthrotic joints. We have diarthrosis, also known as diarthrotic joints. These are freely movable. In other words, these joints allow for the most range of movement in the body. Now, the way that I remember diarthrotic joints is, well, I know this is going to sound terrible and I'm sorry for that, but it helps me to remember that when we die, we are free. So if that helps you remember diarthrosis, joints are freely movable, use it. Diarthrosis, when we die, we are free, freely movable. So all diarthrotic joints are synovial joints, which are the most common type of joint. Synovial joints consist of articulating bones surrounded by a joint capsule. And within the joint capsule, there is synovial fluid, which reduces the friction during joint movement by lubricating the joint's cavity. Now there are six types of synovial joints. Let's go ahead and cover each one of these briefly. The very first one we have is ball and socket joint. 
This joint is a ball-like end of one bone that fits in the cup-like socket of another. For example, we have the hip. We have the acetabulofemoral joint, where the head of the femur is the ball-like bone that fits in this socket known as the acetabulum. Also, we have the shoulder, known as the glenohumeral joint. We have the head of the humerus, this ball-like bone inside the socket of the glenoid cavity. Next, we have gliding joints. This joint is formed when two flat surfaces of bones articulate. So you can see these right here, articulate, where they would glide. We have the intertarsals, so all within the tarsals in between them, they'll glide, as well as the intercarpals. So all between the carpals are gliding joints. Next, we have a hinge joint. This joint functions like a hinge on a door that we would only be able to open or close in one direction or in one plane. For example, the knee, the tibial femoral joint, where the tibia and the femur meet. The elbow, which is the humeral ulnar or humeral radial joint, where the humerus meets the radius or the ulna, right here creating the elbow. Next, we have the pivot joint. This joint allows for rotation around an axis. For example, the joint between C1 and C2 of the vertebrae creates the atlantoaxial joint. So C1 and C2. And the joint at the proximal end of the radius that allows the radial head to rotate around a ring made of annular ligaments, so right here, allowing for supination and pronation at the forearm. Next, we have the condyloid joint. This joint is formed when an oval-shaped surface fits within the ellipsoid socket or cavity. Therefore, this joint is also known as an ellipsoid joint. For example, we have the radial carpal joint right here, where the distal end of the radius creates this ellipsoid, ellipsoidal socket right here, meets the proximal carpals, which creates this oval-shaped carpal, as well as the metacarpal phalangeal joints, where the metacarpal bones meet the proximal phalangeals. Another example is the metatarsal phalangeal joints, where the metatarsals meet the proximal phalanges. So this joint right here. Here. And then finally, we have the saddle joint. This joint is formed within the surface of a convex bone, fits within the concave surface of another bone. For example, we have the trapezial metacarpal joint, where the metacarpals convex base of the thumb. So you'll see this right here, the metacarpal convex base of the thumb meets the concave, notice that it kind of caves in right here, trapezium carpal of the wrist. So this is known as a saddle joint. We have the sternocavicular joint, which is right here, where the convex surface of the clavicle meets the concave surface of the sternum. So this is also known as a saddle joint. Now, you want to make sure that you understand the functional classifications of synarthrosis, diarthrosis, and amphiarthrosis. There is a strong chance that you may see this type of material on the emblex. Remember that anatomy and physiology is going to consist of 12% of the emblex. That means that there will be somewhat around 12 questions out of 100 that will cover materials like what we covered just now. So make sure you know this stuff. As always, feel free to reach out to me. You can find my email in the About Me section of our YouTube channel. Also, check out the courses and study resources on the Teachable platform that are available. If you haven't already taken advantage of the hundredable multiple choice practice questions that I created free of charge, I would encourage you to do that. And also, there are hard copy resources that you can practice labeling the major landmarks, bones, or muscles with an expo marker available on the Etsy account that will help you better prepare for the Inblex. If you found this video helpful, please consider donating. You can find a donation link in the About Me section of our YouTube channel. This helps me to continue creating free content for all of you. No amount is too small to give. These small measures of appreciation help us significantly. And if you've already donated this month to your favorite charitable cause, consider donating next time. Y'all have a wonderful week ahead, and I will see y'all in the next video. Y'all take care.